good good uh, good morning everyone um so uh let me start off if i can like if i can manage it with the title uh from the age of aluminium to carbon free aluminium smelting uh, a historical perspective on modernization discourses in the case of Savoie's aluminium valley um so uh basically the points of this presentation is to look critically the concept of transition. Uh, now, a lot has been said on this by, by historians, uh, but um, what I want to try and add to these discussions is, uh, is, is both a dimension from mountain regions and uh, a dimension from a, from a global industry, which is, uh, which is uh, the aluminum industry, which might sound uh, a bit technical at first, but um, is actually very relevant because, uh, because aluminum is a, is a very good uh, it's a very good past and current example of um, of an industry based on technology, on energy, and on um, uh, which is very much associated to, uh, to to narratives of modernity and to and to narratives of transition. And now, keeping in mind, obviously, with today's theme, um, so the idea here is to look at the example of the Morian Valley, which is uh, one of the big industrial valleys. Uh, of the Alps, along with the other valleys such as the Tarentaise, uh, the, um, the, 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 the Romanche, uh, that was born at the end of the 19th century out of uh, the invention of hydroelectricity. Uh, but out of these, the Moraine Valley uh, is, uh, is, 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 is more, specifically known, more specifically known as the Aluminium Valley. Uh, because it was dominated by the industry, uh, and because from 1891 to 1907, uh, six uh, six aluminium factories were built, which is the uh, the image, the map you have on the left-hand corner, uh, and really, uh, really the growth of aluminium production in the in the Moraine Valley is spectacular throughout the 20th century, uh, and that is due to the uh, to number one the global rise in consumption uh, of of aluminium. Uh, aluminium was a very rare metal in the 19th century when it was discovered by chemists. Uh, it, it sometime, and sometime during the 1950s, uh, it became the world's second most used metal behind steel. Uh, and, and that is due also to the, to the, the, the firm, um, firm in the Aluminium Valley's position as, as prime movers of the sector, which allowed them to dominate uh, the market and later merge into the firm Pechine. Uh, which became one of six aluminium global player producers in the post-war years. Uh, so now, obviously, that will come as hopefully will come as no surprise that the aluminium valley is probably the most the most hailed example of an uh, industrial success story. Uh, thanks to the pioneer role it played in spearheading the transition from from coal to hydroelectricity. Uh, the, the rolling planes spearheading the transition from the age of aluminium to no, the age of steel, sorry, to the age of aluminium, uh, 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 and basically from there on, this narrative goes into a century of energy, uh, technological revolutions, each one ushering great new eras of near continuous economic, social, and, and, and environmental progress for the for, for, for mountain regions. And, and that narrative is still very strong today. Uh, aluminium is now hailed as a uh, crucial metal of the of the transition, mainly because it is light, so uh, so more efficient to reduce the weight of vehicles. Um, it's easy to recycle, uh, and because it keeps promising on these uh, technological innovations, and, and one of the latest uh, and, and harking, harking back to the title is a process to produce carbon-free aluminium which has been hailed as a characteristic example of disruptive innovation and, and a complete revolution regards, with regards to, uh, to climate change. Or even though as of today, uh, production uh, has not yet, uh, yet moved, of production of carbon-free aluminum has not yet moved beyond uh, the pre-industrial stage. So, so, so the plan here is to show in what way this narrative is, uh, is misleading way it is sometimes wrong and here I want to put forward two 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 main reasons uh the first one is while these transition are, are presented as as being as having been uh histor historically uh consensual uh they are in fact not and the second reason is that whilst there is in a sense transition from coal to hydroelectricity and a more or less continuous uh reduction of environmental impacts uh, that narrative only works in a, in a very narrow, limited, geographic and, and positivist sense. 
Uh, if you look at it more globally, if you look at the, the aluminum industry more globally, what you see is the continuous building of large infrastructure, uh, of energy and mineral infrastructure, which tend to not reduce but aggravate uh, some of the industry's economic, environmental and social impacts along its production chains. Um, so, uh, so the plan here is to, to, to is looking at past discourses of transition and how they were perceived from the point of view of uh, one mountain region, from the point of view of the, the uh, Aluminium Valley. So we'll have, we'll, I'll, I've divided this into two uh, big, uh, big parts. Uh, we'll have a first part on the transition from coal to electricity, which roughly defined starts uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, ends at uh, the, the beginning of World War II. And then we'll look at the transition from the age of aluminium to green aluminium, uh, which is, I think is pretty interesting too, which actually takes hold in the post-war years. Uh, so it makes sense chronologically and uh, to, to, to include afterwards. And then I will conclude on, um, on what, um, what is going on with aluminium, uh, uh, with the aluminium industry globally uh, today uh, uh, at the present. So, so the idea of a transition from the age of coal and uh, to from the age of coal to the age of uh, Hydroelectricity, something that's rather well known uh, to historians of the Alps. In its most basic terms, it's a classic history, uh, uh, a classic modernization story. It goes something like before the Blanche, the Alps are outside of history due to, due to periphery, due to lack of state penetration, uh, due to the absence of progress, innovation in a, in a technological sense. Um, then suddenly, uh, hydroelectricity turns this narrative on its head and ushers in a new era of energy, which is a huge step forward uh, in the evolution of humanity, not only for its untold economic and social benefits, but because contrary to coal, uh, hydroelectricity uh, is promoted as sustainable, while more abundant form of, uh, of energy. Uh, that, uh, and, and it is promoted as being uh, as help uh, well, that, um, to put an end to smoke in large cities, to smogs, like, Famous 19th century smugs. Uh, it, it, will, it will say it will take industrial development away from urban and coal areas uh, and transfer it uh, in the Alps, where it would result in the moral uplifting of the working class uh, by exposing them to nature, uh, by bringing them back to nature. And because it will help end the de deforestation through rational management of the Alps uh, water and uh, forest resources. And finally, uh, because it would put an end to industrial pollution. And indeed, the new modern electrochemical process were promoted as perfectly innocuous. Uh, co contrary to the former chemical processes, uh, so the switch here from chemical to electrochemical processes. Uh, chemical processes such as uh, such as Leblanc process, process to produce um, uh, chloride and sodium. Uh, who were, who were mass, mass produced uh, chemicals in the 19th century and were, were, were commonly known to be so polluting that they uh, completely had completely de devastated whole whole regions around around uh, around factories. So. So while it's not factually wrong that the Alps were indeed uh, transitioning from coal to electricity, these discourses kind of completely glossed over uh, simple facts. Uh, one is that electricity is hard to transport, which means most other regions still rely on coal, and there was not much of a, uh, a switch from uh, coal to electricity globally when taken, well looked at globally, but, but rather in addition. Um, also, these discourses did not take into account rebound effects, which is uh, something um, which is well known uh, and at least and uh, has been known since the, the middle of the 19th century. Uh, because it's it's fine if production process pollute less. However, they also made to produce more, which means at one point you might actually increase pollution rather than reduce it. Uh, and well, three, uh, they have a. These discourses kind of have a tendency to focus on the um, on the modern, on the electrochemical part, on the energy aspects of production. Tend to forget about production chains when, in fact, it produce aluminium, uh, and that is the um, map you have in the left-hand corner. When, in fact, to produce aluminium, you, you still need to extract four tons of bauxite, 
Uh, yeah, six to eight tons of coal uh, and four tons of co caustic soda, I think it's called, uh, to produce two tons of aluminum through, yes, uh, electrochemical processes. And only then do you get a single ton of aluminum. Uh, uh, Unboxing is actually quite rare, so aluminum production right from the beginning needs, needs uh, to access bauxite and implement global production change, which you can get a sense of uh, if you look at the map. So contrary to, 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 um, to a common idea in that somehow all of this, uh, and by, the, by this I mean industrial pollution, uh, industrial development, uh, was more accepted in the past uh, from the point of view of local populations in the Moyenne Valley. The Eau Blanche is, not, uh, is definitely not perceived as the ultimate model of development. Uh, and this is obvious if you explore local literatures lo uh, uh, and local newspapers. You get a sense that they have a different uh, idea of what it means to be modern, and that they have different ideas of what uh, a, a, a good model of economic development uh, is um, and how it is desirable and, and economically efficient for, them, for, for the Moyen Valley. And in fact, they have also they also have a different vision of their own history uh which which which, be, go, which did not wait for hydroelectricity to 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 go through its economic takeoff uh which according to 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 them uh actually happened decades ago uh and, and was the result of the construction of the international train line of the the Mont Cenis during the 1850s and 1860s uh, which, links which links France to Italy through uh, 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 through the Moyen Valley, uh, uh, and this uh, again, according according to them, has generated has already generated lots of economic activity, uh, basically by allowing the a lot of the products of the valley to be transported cheaply to um, to, to to markets, and among those products you find uh, finished industrial and agricultural goods such as uh, cheese, wine. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of uh, stone from the quarry, uh, from the valley's many uh, quarries. Um, but this was, uh, has also generated a new uh, touristic economy, with the Moyen being promoted as 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 a more authentic alternative to uh, to, to the overpopulated tourist resorts of Switzerland. Uh, uh, and the watercolor you have here on the left. Sides is from John Ruskin, who actually travelled through uh, the valley during the middle of the 19th century and uh, well, obviously wrote about it on, in, in very romantic uh, terms. Um, and when it comes to, 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 to industrial pollution, uh, what comes out of the archives is, is uh, that, really no one, that no one really buys into the idea that uh, those factories are, are going to be pollution-free because the processes are, are, are more technologically advanced. Uh, in fact, air pollution generates considerable re resistance movements, uh, not only against the aluminum industry in the Moyen Valley, but against other carbide, calcium, chloride uh, factories uh, in, in other industrial valleys. Uh, Tarantes is one, uh, one of the main ones. And what these movements have in common is, is, uh, is uh, striving to preserve uh, public health uh, from air pollution uh, and striving to preserve uh, economic livelihoods, uh, whether it's the uh, rich agricultural uh, economy of the Moyen Valley or the, the, the considerable thermal industry in the Tarantes Valley. Uh, however, these movements are, are, are short lived. Uh, the beliefs, um, sanitary, sanitary authorities' beliefs in, in um, are kind of aligned with those of the promoters of the Wee Blanche, and they, they also tend to believe that these processes are in fact in very uh, completely in innocuous. Uh, and well, they deny these protest movements uh, access to state rights uh, and basically their rights as citizens to be protected from uh, from pollution, to be protected from uh, destruction of property. And and, w and while they emerge with every growth of production, uh, they are each time short-lived because of the difficulties uh, it, uh, it's, it takes to sustain um, such, uh, such movements and such collective action. Uh, now, the transition from the age of aluminum to the age of green aluminum is, is also very interesting. Uh, the construction of a discourse on the age of aluminum originates uh, initially in the 19th century when the metal was discovered but uh, at that time didn't gain much traction. 
uh, until after World War II, when the really aluminium uh, takes off uh, as a as a mass-produced and mass-consumed metal, and uh, and this is again having issues here. Uh, this is when emerges or, or re-emerges a discourse on the age of aluminium, which in France is a, a narrative that it's the, the firm Pechenet is instrumental in constructing and promoting, and the way it did that is Pechenet took to writing its own history, which served a couple of uh, functions. One's preserve, uh, the obvious one is to preserve the firm's heritage. Uh, another one is to promote the metal, uh, to promote aluminium as a metal of science, as a, as a metal of the future, as a, uh, uh, which other competing metals such as steel or copper are not. Uh, because they were discovered uh, earlier. Uh, and the way they do that is by highlighting its uses in industrial sectors that are at the frontier of technological uh, progress, such as uh, automobile uh, in, the, in the early 20th century, later aviation, uh, and later uh, aeronautics. Um, three... Um, the, 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 this, this, this history served to, 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 to defend the firm against its critics, uh, against uh, critics of the, of the metal as a, as a sort of cheap substitute. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, cheap substitute critics of the metal that say the metal is toxic, uh, promoters of the nationalization of energy, 1947. Uh, now bear in mind that aluminum production is very highly dependent on, on, on electricity. Uh, critics of uh, pollu industrial pollution, critics of, um, uh, of landscape change, etc., etc. And, and while that narrative was criticized in the 1970s when Pechenin was named France's greatest polluter, uh, uh, and the Moraine uh, Valley was requesting uh, the Death Valley, uh, it was quickly reclaimed by the firm when Pechenet's engineers came up with the techno technological solutions to drastically curtail uh, fluoride emissions, which is kind, of which um, at the time still is, kind of hailed as a classic eco-modernization success story. And out of this came this graph produced by Pechenet's head en environmental engineer, which I find fascinating on how it epitomizes eco-modernization discourse. How it's built is by putting together one indicator for fluoride, fluoride emissions, expressed in terms not of uh, in terms of tons, but in kilograms of particles emitted per ton of aluminium produced, uh, which is a perf performance indicator, uh, an efficiency indicator that was constructed in the post-war period and is and is depicted in the um, or with the black dots and the reds uh, connected by the red lines. And it, that is compared to production, which is depicted in green. And what comparing the two does, uh, uh, and it, it would not work if you took uh, fluid fluoride emissions simply in terms of tons emitted. What it does is to create a scissor effect, uh, which is really weird, because it shows one of the worst years uh, in terms of quantities of fluoride emitted, which is 1959, somewhere at the, uh, at the crossroads in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the scissor. So, so, so again, maybe I'll stop here, because uh, I'm running out of time. So you get, you get this narrative that focuses on technology and once again gloss over rebound effects. Uh, but what's interesting here is how this uh, kind of raises, how this uh, at the time raised the issue of uh, the distributed nature of technological innovation. Because uh, these technological innovations were only implemented, uh, did, did, I mean, I'm talking about the, the drastic redu re, um, reduction of uh, environmental pollution, were only implemented in Pechenet's modern factories. Uh, in the Aluminium Valley, it was implemented only in one of the six uh, factories, uh, and basically served to justify the closure of the other five factories, which were... Uh, Disqualified for as pollutants uh, from during the 1990s and early 2000s. So to end, to conclude quickly on our current period, a couple of open questions. Uh, is aluminium a metal of the transition? Uh, our current transition uh, discourses in the Moyen Valley, the new narrative progress. Do they showcase the very same uh, enthusiasm about the events of the new digital economies, uh, new modes of transportation? And do they still s use the same narratives of progress uh, that focus on consumer users of technology and still gives very little thought on, 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 on the huge production chains you need to, put in, to implement uh, in order to maintain uh, these going? 
Uh, and is aluminum the metal of the transition? Uh, in any case, aluminum is now mostly produced in Asia, in South America. More than half is produced with coal, not uh, hydroelectricity. Uh, some of its factories now produce more than a million ton per year and consume uh, as much as electricity as a city of a few million inhabitants. Uh, some of the world's largest dams, such as the Monte Bello, uh, Bello Monte, sorry, uh, China's three gorges, were constructed partly to um, for, alum uh, for aluminium production. And and, and as, as of now, the whole history of the industry is one of continual increase of environmental degradation through the, 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 the implementation of huge production chains and huge minimal energy infrastructure, which uh, which kind of begs the question here: uh, Are disruptive innovations going to help to help us get uh, to rid uh, aluminium of its dependency to huge bauxite resources to global mineral energy and infra infrastructure? And, and now, given the highly technological nature of the the industry, uh, it is a possibility. But as far as no, as I know, there is very little history to back this up. From the uh, century of failed attempts to, uh, at finding alternative process uh, to get rid of bauxite uh, when it was not available during um, during wars, for example, uh, and because more uh, more generally, um, for example, recycled aluminium has a rich history that has been steadily growing since the 1950s. As of today, it has never really curbed the production of, of regular aluminium, which has continued to rise ever, ever, ever since. So, well, open questions. Thank you for listening to me and waiting for your questions.